Welcome to Noon Tunes. Those of you who know me know that in my late 20s I took a major turn from music into Tibetan Buddhism and, and studying Tibetan language. And uh, <clears throat> at one point I went to the East Coast. I was translating for a Tibetan meditation master there, three different centers. <clears throat> and around that time, um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche had popularized prayer wheels, had really brought them into the forefront of the attention of, of Western students and had placed Ma uh, mantras on microfilm so that there could be millions of mantras written on a very small spool of, of microfiche. <clears throat> and uh, this inspired me to want to make a prayer wheel because the one of the attractions of the very large prayer wheels is that they have millions and you know, billions of mantras in them and when you set them in motion you're setting in motion this amazing blessing for the area. And so I thought, wow, if I could have that, that similar number of uh, mantras in a smaller prayer wheel that I could just carry around, wouldn't that be cool? And <clears throat> so at first I thought of making something in metal, but I didn't have much experience with metal work. And then I thought, well, maybe I could draft something that a woodworker could make. And I did that and uh, had a, a, wood, a, wood ma a woodworker make it for me on the East Coast there. 
And when I brought it back to California, then my, uh, my friend and, and student, Ivory Tom, he said, I want one of those. <laughs> and together we put together a shop for making these prayer wheels and distrib distributed them pretty widely. <clears throat> so I was inspired at one point to write a song about the origins of the prayer wheel. It's based on a calling on song to an English uh, folk song. <clears throat> but um, I like to do this because I like to spread the teachings of this wheel of Dharma. Good people pray, come listen to me. A tale of great wonder all told. How a vast and profound wheel of Dharma found its way all into our fold. The Lord of compassion, he spoke thus. Ayi Nagarjuna by name, guide you to the land of the dragons. Has there something I'd have you there do? For there in the Nagaland palace, there dwells the dragon king. He is there a great Bodhisattva who owns a wondrous wheel. If you were to go there and fetch it, it would bring great aid to all beings. So the great hero Nagarjuna, he went there and made his request. The king of the dragons, he answered, <clears throat> the Buddha of boundless light kindly gave us this great wheel of Dharma. It has brought dragons much happiness. Through this wheel there are many among us who truly have found freedom's path. This wheel is the wheel of Chen Rezi. That of Omani Pehme Hong. It brings in the love and the wisdom of every awakened being who will grant it if you them petition. And so I will give it to you. And you must place it upon earth, in water or fire or in wind. You must use it for sake of all creatures. And so it came into our land. It was passed to the lion-faced Dakini, and from her to great Tilopa. Naropa Marpa Milarepa Kampopa and down to our times. So now to conclude with this story, I'd have you bear these words in mind. Spread the teachings of this wheel of Dharma. And chant O Mani Padme Hum. O Mani Padme Hum. O Mani Padme Hum. O Mani Padme Oh,
This mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, is that of Avalokiteshvara, Chen Rezi in Tibetan, the manifestation of the compassion of all the Buddhas. Mani means jewel, and Padme or Padma means lotus. And they symbolize all of the aspects of love and compassion and wisdom, respectively that are always unified in the teachings of Buddha. Om is a mantra that can symbolize the body, speech, and mind of living beings. It has three sounds in it, Aum. <laughs> and uh, it also symbolizes the, the body, speech, and mind of the awakened beings, of the Buddhas, of the enlightened beings. And Hung at the end is expressive of a prayer so all in all, one way of uh, interpreting this mantra would be, you know, may all living beings, through a union of love and wisdom, awaken into fully enlightened state. <clears throat> so the way this uh, transition happened for me is that I, I found myself after some wandering in southern Indiana, met musicians there, met a really flourishing community dance and folk music revival that was going on there. And uh, I'd always wanted to have a music store. I, I started a, a music store there, had lessons, repairs. And one of the musicians I met there was the extraordinary Willie Schwartz, a genius of a musician, originally from Holland, Michigan. So we played uh, in a duo together, touring uh, schools, playing for school assemblies, and in other settings. And he was very accomplished in Indian music, really served to awaken my, my interest in the Indian, in the Eastern Indian music. And he was also the curator of the archives at the Indiana University. And he had access to all these unusual musics and he would listen to them and, and work out tunes. We would, we would practice them together. At one point he came across the amazing overtone singing of the Tuvan people and the Mongolian people. And this was that, <clears throat> that um, overtone chant in which there was a very high melody that would, could be heard over the fundamental tone. And I was fascinated by this. I was just so drawn to it. And I had uh, met David Hikes, who has a choir that performs this kind of music in New York. And he had given me a clue as to how it's done, but didn't really tell me. So today I want to offer you a special gift for anyone who's interested to learn how to do this overtone chant. So I was, we were traveling around in a, a station wagon with 20, over 20 instruments, different instruments from, we're playing music of five continents. And, uh, and we would stay sometimes um, in schools and school auditoriums and, and there, and also just right in the front seat of my car, I had a place where I could experiment because um, there was an echo there. There was, the sound would be brought back to me so I'm going to raise this up. I'm not sure how this will <clears throat> mic. But I just kept experimenting until one day I discovered how to do it, basically. And we 
very quickly incorporated it into our act. <clears throat> so first of all, to give you a little uh, demonstration of what this is like. Hmm. you can hear that that high sound coming through <clears throat> I would have a lot of fun with this uh, performing it for kids <clears throat> one time there, the kids were looking at me and said this one guy said I saw your mouth move <laughs> and another time I was I was riding with uh, in an Indian train <clears throat> and uh, there was a, a mother and child sitting on the seat across from me and I just pretended that I was turning on something that's called a shruti box that just creates a drone. I went, and I started playing this <laughs> invisible flute for them. <clears throat> so there are people who have really brought this kind of art to a very high level. Of course, traditionally in Tuva and Mongolia, there's many... <clears throat> um, performers of this. It does uh, seem to have, I don't know much about the, uh, the origins of it, but it does seem to be something associated with the shamanism and the, um, and the high tones, I believe, are intended to communicate with, uh, with, with spirits. <clears throat> but the way you do it, and like I say, there's, there's, a, there's a woman named Berezan who's brought it to very high levels of, of skill. I mean, <clears throat> see, the thing is, <clears throat> with any tone of music, you have various harmonics that are present in the tone. Um, and there are multiples of the original vibration. So when you go up, uh, you know, so in a particular vibration is also present a vibration that's twice that or three times that, or four times that. And as you do that, uh, you hear these different tones start to come out. In the first octave, by touching this string in the center, I can get it to vibrate at twice the speed of the, the full string. <clears throat> and you hear, it brings it up an octave. When I <clears throat> get the string to vibrate in thirds, then we get a fifth of the tonic note sounding. When we go to the, the four, four times the original uh, vibration, we get back to the tonic. So we're back to one. <clears throat> and then when we, when we go to five, six, seven times and so on, the, the fundamental tone, what starts to happen is that the, the, the harmonic pitches are closer together. From the tonic, it goes to the, the second. Can't really hear it there. And then the third, then a raised fourth. Can't really hear it. <clears throat> but these, these are the, um, the tones that start to emerge. And so you start to get a scale there in that upper octave, and that's what's being used in the harmonic overtone singing. One of the names for it is Humi, <laughs> which I've sometimes joked about as I, as I do it and create a phantom flute off in the distance and people ask, is that you? And I go, who, me? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so the way you do it is you find a tone 
And just, I want, yeah, th that the woman, Berezan, that does this thing, it's incredible what you can do. But because, because since you have all these various intervals available, if you change the, fu the fundamental tone, the lower tone, then you can reach just every sort of, of melody note. And she makes an incredible uh, production of this. But, um, <clears throat> but I just want to share the basic concept for somebody who's interested, who would like to experiment with it, because it was so much fun to discover on my own. And uh, <clears throat> so what you do is you start with a, a tone that's in the middle of your range, one that you can just belt out you know, really strongly. And then from there, you go into a hum, which is having your tongue in the shape of a nya, nya, N-Y-A. But, but filling your, your mouth so that none of the vocal cord sound is coming through. <clears throat> so you've got your tongue in this kind of position. Nya tends to put the back of your tongue up against your upper palate with your tip of your tongue dipping down into the, the, the cavity of your mouth in front. <clears throat> and so then the trick is that as you've got the back of your tongue pressed up against the palate, you contract it slightly right there against the palate so that it opens up a little hole. Now, this is not a case of a whistle, you know, sound, you know, air coming through and making a whistling sound, but, but it's, it's an opening by which those different harmonic pitches can come through. And if you're experimenting and practicing, the first thing to do is to try to just get that sound to come out. And when I, when it first came out for me, I was sitting in the front seat of this, uh, this station wagon and suddenly this bell, this high bell sound popped out. It was so exciting. <clears throat> and, and when that happens, don't immediately try to change it. I would say, try to strengthen it, see if you can get it to come out more and more strongly. And then after some experience with that, then it's by moving your tongue slightly, experimenting, you can find the ways that, that um, it brings out the different pitches. So, so the way I'm going to demonstrate this, I don't want to blow you away with how loud it is really underneath. So I'm just going to open up the hum for just a brief moment so you can get an idea of this, the power of the, of the voice that's underneath the hum that you, that you need in order to be able to do this. <clears throat> So you see there's that really loud sound underneath. The nya hum, the tongue fills out your mouth makes it into a hum, and then you just try to contract that back part <laughs> of your tongue. Draw it away from the upper palate so it opens up just a small hole between your tongue and the upper palate, right there in the back of the middle of your tongue. And <clears throat> when I say that you should find a, t a pitch that's in the middle of your range, it makes a difference for what sorts of harmonics are available. If you're in a very low part of a lower part of your range, it'll it'll enable some of the higher harmonics to be heard. Whereas if you're in an upper part of your vocal range, it'll be very difficult to reach those higher harmonics. You'll get only uh, lower ones. So if you're in the middle of your range, then <clears throat> you'll be able to find that uh, <clears throat> find a place where you can reach many of those pitches of that scale. Of the, um, it's actually it'll be in the let's see, the first octave, the second octave, third octave. It's up in the fourth octave. The fourth octave above your fundamental pitch is where you're getting the first, second, major third, raised fourth, fifth, minor sixth, major sixth, minor seventh, major seventh. And then the octave finally again. You get that, that scale up in the fourth octave above. <clears throat> in the octave below that, the third octave above the fundamental, you get um, a th major third, fifth, and a minor seventh. 
And as you go down from there, it was as I demonstrated before, there's that one-fifth that's in there in the second octave. And in the first octave, octave is just the, uh, the fundamental. There's no <clears throat> pitches in between. But if you have any questions about this or if you'd like to uh, get further guidance or help in discovering how to do it, uh, drop me an email at davidwmolk at gmail.com. Uh, my last name, M-O-L-K. So David with W, Molk, uh, gmail.com. <clears throat> So how about a, a Celtic air?
do a couple of jigs there. The hag with the money. Forget the name of the second one. Then a little bit of uh, Bennis Misfortune at the end. So, let's see. I think I'll move down towards the southern United States, around Louisiana, where my mama's from. Hello, Mother Marguerite, one of my biggest fans. You know, when you, um, <clears throat> the button accordion that's uh, played down in Cajun country, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a diatonic harmonica, I mean, uh, accordion, which uh, gives you the different tones on the push and pull. So it's really similar to a harm harmonica. It's like a big harmonica. So I, I got into trying to imitate that, uh, that Cajun accordion sound with the harmonica. <clears throat> but first, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try playing this uh, <clears throat> version of House of the Rising Sun. Not in the usual way, but um, <clears throat> the way that Lead Belly, Huddy Ledbetter played it on, I believe, probably on his 12 string. <clears throat> Adjusted right. Now the only thing 
that a gambler needs is a suitcase and a trunk. And the only time that he's really satisfied is when he's on the drum. I'm going back to New Orleans My race is almost run I'm going back to spend the rest of my life Beneath that rising sun
was thinking of trying this uh, jig, which was the very first jig I ever tried to play on the fiddle. It's called, I think it's called the, the Fair Haired Boy, if I'm remembering this correctly. And <clears throat>
So for my uh, last piece today, I'll try some banjo and harmonica here. Try this uh, <clears throat> this song. I, th I learned it from I think Jody Stecker. <clears throat> A little tune called "Dony Gal." <clears throat> On 
Cause I had no banjo Strings were made of twine Only tune and do would play Was trouble on my mind Shady Grove, my little love Shady Grove, my darling Shady Grove, my little love Headed back to Harlem Peaches in the summertime, apples in the fall. If I can't hide the girl I love, I don't want none at all. Shady Grove, my true love.